Welcome to the Savage Leader Podcast. Today's guest is Navid Alipur. Navid is the founder and managing director of Analytics Ventures, which is a venture formation fund focusing on artificial intelligence, deep learning, and the Internet of Things. Navid is also the CEO of CureMetrics, which is a global leader in artificial intelligence for medical imaging committed to the advancement of technology that improves cancer survival rates worldwide. Navid, thanks for coming on today. Thank you, Darren. Thanks for having me. So your story is an interesting one. How did you get involved in AI as someone who studied political science, economics, Middle Eastern history, but also have your JD MBA? Yeah, so I didn't even know what venture capital was in college back in the late 90s, to be honest. So, you know, after, you know, finishing undergrad at UCSD, like you said, you know, poli sci, econ background. So I'm not technical. I don't code. I'm not a data scientist. Uh, And from there, I went on to grad school, wanted to stay in San Diego, went to USD, did my uh, law and my MBA there. And I went the finance route for about 10 years at your, you know, traditional firms, your Merrill Lynch's, Smith Barney's of the world. And uh, long and short of it is I always wanted to start my own business and become fascinated with startups. And had kind of immersed myself in the San Diego Venture Group and other organizations in town that you know work with startups in different capacities. And so started putting my money where my mouth is, making some angel investments in startups. And in this process, met one of my partners, Blaise Bardlev. He's a Frenchman who came here in his early 20s, had a very successful, one of the most successful San Diego companies, in fact, website story. It was one of the few internet companies in the late 90s that made money from day one. And then ultimately IPO'd and got acquired by Adobe. So Blaze and I were introduced by a mutual friend. We complimented each other well. He is technical. And so he said, Hey, you know, why don't we do this full time instead of just investing in startups on the side? Let's do something. And it's not about Navid or Blaze. So we ended up starting Analytics Ventures. And about a year into this venture, we were approached by some scientists out of UCSD. And a lot of people don't know UCSD is one of the epicenters of artificial intelligence dating back you know, to the very beginning of the university. And so you know, they had heard about us and our focus and our emphasis on software. And so they came to us and, and said, look, AI, machine learning will impact us and change the world. And you know, some would argue more than more ways than the internet itself has. And anywhere that you could make a prediction, a recommendation, a forecast, or detect something that does not belong, using AI and machine learning, one can increase revenues, decrease costs by bringing operational efficiencies, or in the healthcare sense, at Cure Metrics, uh, by detecting breast cancer earlier, we all know that prolongs life and saves life, right? And so that's where I'm particularly most proud of our healthcare companies. But that's really how we got into AI, is a bit of you know, luck meeting opportunity. We were at the right place. And we ended up seeing that when we really got into it about six years ago, again, the term AI is not new. It's been around since the late 50s, but we realized that this is going to change our lives and that we're at a cornerstone in history. And so we decided to laser focus and say we are, you know, an AI focused venture fund, irrespective of what industry. Yeah, there's definitely so much potential in seeing some of those early application of AI. Can you talk a little bit about your portfolio companies and what they're doing with AI to benefit consumers broadly? Sure. I mean, on the healthcare front, of course, as I mentioned, Cure Metrics, which I, I am wearing the CEO hat on, and, and we can talk about that later and how that happened. But at Cure Metrics, we have FDA clearance, the first of its kind. It's just software. But because it's a diagnostic for the FDA, we have to get that clearance, that seal of approval, call it, uh, to sell the software. And we detect breast cancer better than any other technology in the world. We are the best AI medical technology in detecting breast cancer currently. And so that's huge, right, in regards to how it impacts the patient. If you want to say the consumer is the doctor, the doctors buy the software. But that's you know one example of how AI impacts lives by in that example of detecting cancer and mammograms better and faster and more accurately. And then on the fintech side, we have AlphaTray, which we applied our, we literally built that internally 100%. We didn't have outside co-founders. And so we've kind of been at it for about three and a half years. And 
are applying AI and machine learning to the stock market. So where our healthcare companies, you know, we feel good, there's social impact. AlphaTray is just about pure, you know, greed and capitalism, just about making more money by detecting signals in the markets. And so we have now spun off a hedge fund, the AlphaTrade Domestic Performance Fund, and brought the former president of LPL, Bill Dwyer, who's one of our investors, has jumped in full time to be the managing partner of the hedge fund since he comes from that world. And so the hedge fund is the first product, but we are looking to bring this technology to the consumers in other vehicles, be it ETFs or be it at some point a self-directed or self-guided called the next Vanguard. We feel that you know Wall Street is very overpaid. So you have a lot of financial advisors and mutual fund managers and we feel that a lot of those fees take away from the retail mom and pop investors. As we all know, with compound interest, if you can reduce those fees, you know, you'll have a lot more retirement. So our goal is to bring more efficiency to the markets there for the consumer. Yeah, you mentioned something interesting. I think a lot of people's misconception is that AI is just the machines taking over. And you talked about how within the, the situation with Cure Metrics, that it's really complementing the work that the radiologist is doing. Can you talk a little bit about that partnership? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So there's a saying I like where it says, you know, is the human in the loop, on the loop, or outside the loop? So the human is in the loop. The human is absolutely essential. And there is no AI machine learning, right? It's just, it's the human is doing their job, whatever that is, be it real estate, be it law, be it in the healthcare vertical. When the human is on the loop, it means there is automation, there is machine learning, but the human oversees it, right? And then if the human is outside the loop, the human is not needed at all. So you could say when we get to self-driving vehicles, um, the human in many ways is outside the loop, right? If we're going to have drones delivering food and medicine and other things, there's no human involved. Or any anything you automate in pieces of machinery where there's no human, they're completely fully outside the loop. But in healthcare, the human needs to be on the loop. They need to be involved. So AI is not going to replace the radiologist in the cure metric example, but the radiologist using AI will replace a radiologist that's not. So AI is a tool to empower the doctors to deliver better care for their patients, to empower them to work more efficiently and deliver better care by detecting cancer better, reducing false positives and false negatives. So, you know, that's where in the healthcare world specifically, if there's bad news to be delivered, you know, you don't want to get an AI chatbot telling you you have cancer. You know, you want a human doctor to, you know, put their arm around you or pat you on the back and say, hey, it's going to be okay. There's things to do. You need that human element. And so all the talk about the robots and the machines taking over, you know, I, I think that that's a little premature, frankly. Now, I think that's an interesting distinction in, in highlighting that partnership. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for companies, not just to replace, but to use AI as a complementary tool to develop businesses. Absolutely. And, you know, something else to note is there are a lot of jobs that people don't want to do anymore. For example, you know, offshore oil rigs, you know, they have certain GE equipment, for example, that if, you know, to get that thing fixed, there are fewer and fewer and fewer people that know how to fix that machine because, our generation and those younger, they don't want those type of jobs. And so this expertise is going away, frankly, to fix certain machines. And so that's where AI and machine learning can come into play to learn you know, the skill set, frankly, to fix that machine and to maintain it before it breaks down. In Japan, another example, the people that fix the rail lines and the train systems, they're saying they're they're having less and less people with that expertise. So before the expertise dies off, they're actually training robots and machines to maintain better and to fix equipment. So it, it becomes to the point where you know there's jobs that we don't want to do. So that's where AI will be a tool to free us to then be more creative, to work on other things, to Again, to not to sound you know cheesy about it, but to take our civilization to a higher level by allowing us to focus on new ventures and new creative means. Yeah, I think that's important is to highlight some of the positive applications. And it seems like most people, at least in the media, are worried about the negative implications of it. 
Look, negative news sells better, right? Whether it's about Elon Musk going on and saying the robots are going to take over. And again, I'm a huge admirer of his, but you know, he's a he's got a public company and he needs to be on the news and that stuff sells. It gets attention, right? The stock market drops 500 points a day. It's on, you know, our KUSI local news and everyone knows about it. But if it goes up 500 points, people don't necessarily talk about it. So bad news just sells better. Yeah, absolutely. So you're in a unique situation. You you look at a lot of companies, a lot of technologies. What are you most excited about looking forward? And what are some of the big opportunities around artificial intelligence? So, you know, I'm, I'm a glass half full type of guy. I know we're in unusual times here in 2020. A lot of tension at a national level, at a geopolitical level. And, you know, just there's a lot of just agitation out there in the world and a lot of doom and gloom. And and I'm just not like that. I mean, we're so fortunate to be living in the time we are and the innovations that are being made across all fields, AI, of course, included, but, you know, with you know, life science and, you know, medicine and transportation and clean energy. And there's so much happening that I think historians are really going to look back on the 2020s as a, a pivotal decade. And artificial intelligence will touch every aspect of that, by the way, from the industrial to the clean tech to the healthcare to the insurance industry, finance, agriculture. Is, there's going to be you know billions more people on less arable land. We need to be more efficient in growing food to feed the world. And so AI is going to play a role in that, whether it's you know the company that was able to, by image recognition, detect weeds better. And deer bought them for $300 million, by the way. And all they did is detect weeds better. So that deer can put that on their tractor and say, hey, buy our tractor instead of, you know, caterpillars, because by helping you detect the weeds better, you'll save money on spraying chemicals. And that's also less toxic, right? And so AI is touching everything. And really three reasons that the time is now. It comes down to more powerful computers, one, two, the cloud. Now, a company like Cure Metrics, we could never build Cure Metrics 10 years ago or before the cloud because we'd have to buy our own data center. So, okay, let me take that back. It would, not that we could never do it. It would cost much, 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 much more to develop what we do. But we're 100% on Amazon's cloud. And so we can get 10 million mammograms tomorrow and process them, right? We don't need our own data center. So that's amazing. That is an amazing fact. So more powerful computers, the cloud and more data, right? Because of Internet of Things, whether the cell phones we're all carrying or the Tesla, Tesla's you know cars are essentially becoming IoT devices, Internet of Things devices. You plug in your card night, it's getting its software updated to you know our Fitbits and pacemakers and sleep apnea machines. Everything is connected to the Internet and everything is generating data. Well, data is useless unless you can get value out of that, right? And so that's what AI does. But because there's data, because there's more powerful computers, and because we have the cloud to process that data cheaper, the algorithms learn. So that's then machine learning, where you feed it more data and it learns and it becomes better. And we couldn't do that if we did not have this alignment of these three forces. What about from a leadership perspective? What are some of the opportunities that leaders should be aware of as about how to think about and potentially even apply AI within their companies? Fantastic question. So when I talk at panels or to students, you know, at colleges or you know any other venue, whether it's for real estate professionals or lawyers or CPAs or engineers. I always say you don't have to be a data scientist to understand the benefits of AI, right? We all use Excel. We know how to use it. We didn't have to develop it, right? We didn't have to develop the software. And so AI is another tool to empower us to do our jobs better and more efficiently. And so from a leadership level, a CEO, a board, uh, senior execs that have control over a company's direction, be it small or be it a Fortune you know, 100 company, if they don't start thinking of how to apply AI to their business, their competitors will eat their lunch and they'll go the way of the dinosaurs. Or to bring it right home to businesses, they'll go the way of Blockbuster Video or you know, Barnes & Noble, 
where they didn't adapt. So leaders have to look at this now and say, how can we be competitive by using AI to squeeze efficiencies from our manufacturing facilities, to advertise better to the right consumers at the right time to increase our sales, to, let's say, a real estate example, to make sure we optimize the rents at our commercial property by getting the right tenants in there. If you know, you, you, San Diego is, I think, the smartest city, or it's got the smart grid, right? Where all the lights are, you know, there's everything smart and there's cameras everywhere. And so if you could tap into that data, which is publicly available, and let's say you, you have a building and whether you're the owner, or you're the commercial real estate broker, you want to get the best tenants in there. So if the camera is showing Mercedes and BMWs and Ferraris and Porsches driving by, and if you have the demographic information of how college educated people are or how much you know level of education they have and degrees and PhDs and so forth, then you say, okay, let's put a Morton Steakhouse in there instead of a Friday's or a Denny's, right? Let's put a high-end gym in there instead of a you know 24-hour fitness. And then the opposite is true also. If you have that information that you know, like look, the camera's recognizing, again, not knocking on Toyota Corollas or or smaller cars that are not Porsches or BMWs, but let's say it's recognizing less expensive cars. The demographic information shows more blue collar versus white collar. Then you need to not put in a more steakhouse or a high end gym, but a 7 Eleven and you know, a 24 hour fitness. And, and so this is a good example in the real estate vertical where l- leaders need to recognize how they could use these tools to win that business, right? If you're that commercial real estate broker to optimize the rents for your building, if you're a pension fund or a REIT, so that your building's value goes up because of optimizing those rents. So that's where in any industry, again, if you can make a prediction or recommendation or forecast or detect something that does not belong in a data set, you can increase revenues or decrease costs. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about in business. Yeah, it could be a tall task for leaders unless they perhaps have a very experienced, knowledgeable chief technology officer. How can leaders of companies or leaders within an organization get started in thinking about opportunities for AI? So that's a key point because the statistic out there was a few years ago, but it was a New York Times article that said there are only 10,000 real data scientists globally in the world. So there aren't that many data scientists. And there's a complaint that as people are going through their masters and PhDs to you know go a whole nine yards to become these esteemed PhD data scientists, the Googles, Amazons, and Facebooks of the world are snapping these people up before they finish their PhD and it's limiting who is left in academia to train the future generations, right? So there is a critical issue with the not having enough scientists. So that's where as a leader of a company, again, we saw an opportunity here. So we created a company, an AI as a service company called Dynam.ai. That's D-Y-N-A-M.ai. And it was for that very purpose because we realized there's a huge vacuum in corporate America because these data scientists are really good ones. They don't want to work for just one company. They don't want to go home to their spouse at the end of the day and say, I work at a you know, I work at Coca-Cola, a soda manufacturer, or Johnson & Johnson, a pharma medical device company, or Harley Davidson, a motorcycle company, or ExxonMobil. And so that doesn't excite them to say they work at one company working on one product, one thing. But all those companies need data scientists. And so that's where we built our own AI lab. That's Dynam AI. And so companies, public Fortune 100 companies on down, from the ResMeds of the world to Boston Consulting Group to Titleist, the golf company, have hired us to leverage our AI bench. And so that's where it's up to a leader, a CEO, a management board of the team or a company to decide, um, do we want to go find the best outside and bring them in to develop for us what we need? And let's focus on being that medical device company. And that's our core efficiency. Or you know, do we want to try to do it in-house? Now, it's not that it can't be done in-house, but it would be a massive, massive investment in time and money. And if you don't have the right person at the top at a, a data scientist level, 
it might be 18 months later until you realize that you got the wrong team. Because a lot of people are slapping AI and machine learning on their resumes and CVs and LinkedIn's. And they're very smart people, but they're using you know glorified business intelligence. They're not really data scientists that or machine learning experts. So that's what senior execs and the leadership team needs to be very cautious of. That's great advice. And what about flipping it around? What are some challenges leaders might be facing and how can they overcome them in terms of adopting artificial intelligence? The biggest challenge is having good, clean, structured data. So we, you have to start there. If you don't have good data, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? You can't train the algorithms to do something if you don't have the data collected in a, a structured manner, right? If you're a hospital and you know you have one person's age but not the others, you have you know one person's weight but not the other, or zip code as in you know demographic areas to detect, let's say, if there's a flu epidemic in a certain area that you want to be able to detect or COVID, right? Things like that. So you have to collect data in that clean, organized, structured manner. And, you know, in Curemetrics, for example, the mammograms, we have to clean the data so they all look the same in regards to the markers, right? Anonymize the personal health info, the PHI, and then the machine learnings can learn from it because you feed it to them and it looks the same way. And so there's a saying that data is a 21st century's oil. Well, we could be sitting on, you know, a company could be the next Saudi Arabia of oil or, or better example, Venezuela. Venezuela has more oil than Saudi Arabia, but they can't get it out of the damn ground because of their politics and a host of other reasons. The country's falling apart. So it's useless. Oil is just sitting in the ground. So data is the same way. You could sit on, be sitting on a mountain of it, a gold mine, and if you can't get it out of the ground, refine it, and turn it into gasoline, it's useless. So I like to say that the refinery is the AI lab, the data scientists, right? So we've built the lab, we have the refinery, and we look to find partners that have the data. And we say, hey, let's get that out of the ground and let's get value out of that data. Let's create value out of that data by helping apply machine learning to detect and automate and predict that will therefore then help that respective business. Yeah, those are great examples of what leaders should be thinking about, both opportunity-wise and challenges. What about from an organizational perspective? What are companies going to need to do to change, to adapt to integrating AI? I think the time has come where there really needs to be a chief AI officer, really like at the senior exec level. You need one person dedicated, and they don't need to be the data scientist, but they need to be the person that is steering that business from a strategic level to look at every piece of that company's business and processes and say, can we automate? Can we apply machine learning? Can we make predictions here? That'll help. Can we make forecasts? Can we detect failure in a machine before it happens? And so there needs to be not only chief AI officers, I I feel strongly at companies, but there's even now PhDs in AI ethics. So if you're building driverless cars or if you're building robots, you have to train those machines to make decisions. And so the analogy, I might have shared this with you in the past, but if I'm driving in my car and I have my daughter in the passenger seat and there's you know a car in front of me, a car behind me, pedestrians to my left or bikers, and a semi-truck is hurtling at me from the other end that if it hits the car, it's going to very in all likelihood kill my passenger, my daughter, and myself. Human response there is to veer the car, you know, where it's not. So that could be veering into the pedestrians. That could be slamming on the brake and having the other car hit you or or accelerating and hitting the car in front. That's what a human would do. But if you're training the car's AI system, the brains, what do you do there? Because if it veers into the people, now your Ford Motor Company, your Toyota, and your car just drove and killed three pedestrians. And yes, it saved the two people in the car. But it, how does it decide that? How does it decide? Does it save the people in the car or the pedestrians? Because if it doesn't do anything, the owners of the car will end up suing Ford or Toyota, right? So it's a tough question. It's an ethical question as how do we train the robots to, you know, what do they do? And this goes, harkens back to you know, I just thought of the iRobot movie with Will Smith from 20 plus years ago, where, you know, the robot saw two cars go over 
and chose to save the character Will Smith plays instead of the eight-year-old girl that died because it detected that the percentage likelihood of him surviving is higher than the girl, whereas a human would have gone for the child, right? The human goes to save a human that's trying to rescue. In that situation, you rescue the child first. And so, again, that's a movie, but science fiction becomes reality. And so companies will increasingly need to have folks trained in AI ethics as they're building their machines, be it robots, cars, or other Internet of Thing devices. So when we look back a few years from now, it seems like the technology part will be the easy part. The challenging part will be how do we solve that ethical problem and who makes those decisions? Absolutely, Darren. You're 100% correct in, in that. And again, these are going to be questions and decisions that need to, need to be made for the next foreseeable future, the next 100 years. And that's to the very point why the human has to be in the loop. The human is not going away. The robots are not taking over. We have to be here to train this amazing technology because the impact will be unimaginable. And we're only in the first or second inning here. So AI is not good or bad. It's not good or evil, right? Just like the automobile wasn't. When the car came around in the turn of the last century, people said, well, you know, what's going to happen to the people that take care of the horses and the carriages and the horseshoes? And, and you're right, all those jobs went away. But look at all the jobs that were created from the auto industry and look at all the great benefits we've had. But the cars also killed tens of millions of people over the last 100 plus years, right? From all car accidents and maimed people and destroyed lives and blew to the air. So the car is not good or bad. It's how it's used. And AI also is not good or bad. It's how it's used. And it will absolutely be used for malintent, for bad purposes, bad actors. And so that's where you need the good guys. You need the, you know, the people, the laws, the regulation, and folks fighting against the bad elements that'll look to use it in detrimental ways. So, I mean, it's going to, again, impact every facet of our lives. And it's not a good or bad thing. It's a technology and we need to adapt to it. And the law needs to catch up. And, you know, the law is always behind technology. It's not just an AI thing, but the law has to catch up to technology. So that's kind of where we are now, where the law will catch up and create laws that are needed to regulate uh, tech and AI tools. A lot of work to be done, that's for sure. Absolutely. So the attorneys don't need to worry. You know, they'll, they'll have plenty of work. Yeah, as they always do, it seems. Indeed. It just, I'd love to switch gears for a minute. And something that's interesting that struck me about your current change in role is in terms of taking on the CEO hat of, I believe, two of your portfolio companies. How has that switch gone where you were looking for great attributes of leaders, perhaps even developing them? Now you're actually sitting in the CEO chair or two CEO chairs. How's that gone? Oh, I've never been busier. That's for sure. And I do have a strong sense of purpose because of these healthcare companies and that if we get these technologies out there, the more lives we're going to touch, the more lives will be impacted, tens of millions, if if not more, over time. And so I don't know if I could have done it at companies that did not have such a big social impact, but with CureMetrics and CureMatch specifically, you know, while we're VCs and the way we're, you know, our law firm, our uh, attorneys at Cooley formed us, we're a plain vanilla venture capital fund. We're VCs, but we're frankly more proud of saying we're entrepreneurs. And so our model under this venture studio model to help create and build companies, we roll up our sleeves. And so we are very operational. And you'll find this in the venture capital industry. There are operators that end up becoming VCs and investors because of their domain expertise, because they were so successful at, you know, being an operator, be it on a marketing front or a product development front or a technology front. And so it's not a new thing to have a partner from a VC fund take an operational role. And it's something that I always made the joke, uh, not the joke, but I always said that, you know, I, I like being on boards and being the investor and a CEO serves at the pleasure of the board, right? A CEO is not the boss. The board is the boss. And so here, the board of both companies, and these are two that, you know, Blaze and I personally founded before raising the current fund. So we're personally co-founders on these two and on the boards, and they have a special purpose for us. In CureMatch, for example, we 
we ended up starting that and it was because blaze had cancer he had terminal cancer and was told he has five years to live and he wasn't just going to take that lying down and was on a quest to meet oncologists from all over the world that are working in new innovative technologies and that's how we met the co-founder with us there a lady by the name of dr rizal kurzrock who's uh, truly one of the top oncologists in the world and that's where Cure Match came from. What they, what she was doing at the Morris Cancer Center in partnership with the Supercomputer Center, uh, or a scientist there she partnered with. And so the board of both companies said, hey, the time has come to kind of transition the companies to the next level. You know these companies better than anyone else outside of the people on the team. You know, why don't you jump in as CEO and to get them to the next level, especially as we're looking at potentially merging them into a larger AI healthcare company, as they're both fighting cancer, right? Cure Metrics detects cancer by in images, and Cure Match is a decision support tool for oncologists where if they want to recommend a three drug combo, that's four and a half million combinations. No human brain can process that. So that's what Cure Match does is it recommends based on the patient specific cancer sequence biopsy in the drugs available what the best combination for that patient would be with amazing results. And so there's been interest from investors to merge these two companies into a larger AI healthcare company with these different divisions. And so I'm kind of steering the ship right now. And, you know, there's a saying that in the startup world where a good CEO is always looking to replace himself or herself. So I'm going to do what's best for the companies. And at some point that's going to be, you know, handing the baton off to someone else to take it to the next level. But right now, the two boards you know, asked me to step in since I know both companies intimately. And so I'm very much enjoying the operational role as CEO in helping steer the companies and the teams in the right direction to ultimately, with our North Stars, get these technologies out there as fast as possible and impact as many lives as possible. Sounds like a very promising future. That's really exciting. Thank you. What have you learned? Just last question for you. What have you learned about yourself from a leadership perspective as you made this shift or really just taken on those two additional hats as being CEOs of both firms? Yeah. You know, it's it's definitely been a learning experience. There's nothing like doing. You know, advice is always easier given than taken. So I've always been giving advice, right? Because I'm on a board and the CEO asks for advice on everything from, you know, who to hire and fire to what product to roll out, who to partner with, et cetera, et cetera. But now wearing the CEO hat myself, of course, I can lean on the board still. Now I'm getting advice from them. But in being on the ground daily, minute by minute, it's different. It's completely different than just being on a board, right? And and so I have a stronger sense of responsibility to steer these companies and also to make them successful, not just for the end user that doctors to impact lives for patients, but you know we have forty plus employees between the two companies. So no, we're not Amazon, but you know those are forty families that their you know their livelihood depends on these companies, you know for getting paid, and that's not lost upon me that uh, you know these companies mean a lot to a lot of people, and so you know I wake up every day saying you know how could I do things bigger, better, faster. And in many ways, I've, I've kind of become a therapist and a marriage counselor. <laughs> I joke because as teams grow, you know, there's sometimes clashes amongst people and there's other, you know, politics internally. And so I have to be much more patient than is natural of me. Let's put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people don't think about the responsibilities that CEOs have. And you made a great point. You're responsible for the livelihood of those 40 folks and their families. So it definitely is a big responsibility. And it's also, you know, in, in addition to that, it's just something else to add. You know, I come from a place of servant leadership. So I'm there to help them do their jobs better. They're not there for me. I'm there for them. And so that's where I come from. And I ask them, you know, every day, every week, on after every Zoom call or, you know, what hurdles can I help? take down? What can I block and tackle on? How can I help you? What's, uh, you know, what's missing here? And what resources do you need to do your job better to meet expectations? And that's really where it comes from is managing those expectations and setting people up for success. What about what's one piece of advice? Obviously, you've got a, a wealth of insight you provided today, but what's one 
insight or a piece of advice you'd give to leaders? I mean, if, again, if I could be so presumptuous to think that it's not known, but I would just emphasize that come from a place of servant leadership and the leader is there to empower the team to, you know, do the job to the best of their abilities and to drive the company. Yes, drive the company to success for shareholders and investors. But you can't forget along the way are those employees that are day in and day out, you know, putting in their blood, sweat and tears. Naveed, thank you so much for coming on today. I know you're incredibly busy with not just one job, but three. So really, truly appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Darren. Anytime. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Savage Leader Podcast. My hope is you are walking away with tactics that you can apply to become a better leader in your life and in your career. If you're looking for additional insight and tactics, be sure to check out my book titled The Savage Leader, 13 Principles to Become a Better Leader from the Inside Out. Also, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, and I would truly appreciate it if you would leave a review and also rate the podcast. Thanks.